Welcome to the Three Championship Drive podcast on YouTube, hosted by me, Lance Caparossi. Follow me on X at Lance Caparossi the same way you see it spelled on the screen. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, like the video, but more importantly, tell a Pistons fan. USA, 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 taking home the gold, baby. Unbelievable fourth quarter performance from Steph, the chef, Curry. Hopefully our listeners in France don't take this personally and don't unsubscribe from the podcast, but hell of a game. Hell of a game for the boys in the red, white, and blue. Loved it. So as I'm watching, I didn't get to watch the whole game because I was working, but I definitely watched the third and definitely watched the fourth quarter. Watched all those threes being rained down on France by, by Steph Curry. It was crazy. But it got me thinking, which pistons could wear the red white and blue for the usa men's national team who would if you had to put money on it today that in four years or in like we'll just say the next three olympics so the next 12 years that we're going to get some pistons on there which pistons would you put money on making the usa men's national team cooper flag when we draft him next year doesn't count because he's not on the Pistons yet. All right, then I'm going to have to say Cade Cunningham out of all. Okay, that's the, an obvious one. It's a little too easy to pick. Uh, but if, if I'm going if, if I'm gonna be actually picking somebody, it'll be when we get the first overall pick next year in the draft, and it'd be Cooper mm-hmm. Flag. Um, fingers crossed that we're not number five overall, what I just jinxed us for the rest of our life. Uh, but it has to be Cade Cunningham. I don't think there's any other answer. So definitely Cade, and I think he's the type of guard that they really could use that can control the pace and get guys involved. Not saying there's not other point guards in the NBA that could do that. It's just that we've had Cade with Team USA Select playing against the men's national team last summer, and he played really well. Like him and Duran, they put on a show, and Cade was talked about a lot by the coaches there. They were really impressed with what Cade Cunningham could do. But outside of Cade, I, I could see Jalen Duran. I definitely think there's a chance for him, especially if he takes that step defensively. But Asar Thompson, this is another guy that I think will be on Team USA at some point. Not as a vocal point, but I could see him being on there as like that defense Jason Tatum player. Yeah, I mean, I guess whatever. Or if you doesn't want to play. Him, you want to make fun of Tatum and you want to put Asar Thompson in the same breath, fine, go ahead. But I think with Asar's skill set, <laughs> And what he brings defensively, he could he could be on Team USA. Even if he's not an all-star, he could be on Team USA as like just a lockdown defender. But those would be my three names. There's a part of me, too, that wants to throw in Isaiah Stewart. But I feel like there's a plenty of guys that are willing to play that, that, that dirty guy role for Team USA. So you don't need Isaiah Stewart. I don't know, man. I... Uh... I don't agree with the SAR making. I, I, I figured you wanted. It's, it's such a definitely not beef stew. Hell no. Um, but it's definitely a toss up because I think this year was more of a statement year for all these older guys that are going to be retiring in the next three to four years, like Steph Curry, LeBron James, Kevin Durant. Like, so the window of opportunity is going to be there. Because in four years, I mean, it's going to be a whole different league. Um, I think it'll be a league run by Luka Doncic. So like, that'll be the guy that's in charge, but he's not going to be able to play for the USA team. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. This year was just different with all the veterans that wanted to go out and win a gold before their season and their career is over in the NBA. Um, it was great to see. LeBron win. I, I don't have a problem with LeBron taking home the MVP of the tournament, even though I think Steph Curry did deserve it, but I'm not against LeBron getting it because he did perform very well overall. But without Steph Curry, this team would not have made it past the semis or got a gold game without him because he went off both fourth quarters of the semis and the finals. So, um, But with the Pistons having opportunity, I mean, it's there. But this team really does need to get better. Like Asar Thompson, yeah, like you call him your Swiss Army knife. He just needs to find a way to shoot the ball. If he can find a way to shoot the ball, then he has the opportunity because he has hustle and he has heart. Um, but but as of right now, with where the league's at, it, it would be tough for a Piston to make that roster. Yeah, but I part of the reason I'm including Asar in this is 
the defense for sure, but also on Team USA, the, I mean, it's already an all-star team. You you have plenty of offense on there. You could sprinkle in a few guys that, you know, they're not going to worry about their shot, but they're still going to give you 110% effort every time they're on the floor. They're not going to complain about their minutes. They're going to do the dirty stuff like hustle, rebound, play defense, dive on the ball. That's what you're going to get with the Sar Thompson. That's why I think he could play on Team USA in that role. And I'm not saying major minutes for Team USA, but being like a 10th man or an 11th or 12th, how many guys they take on the team, that's what I'm saying with an Asar Thompson. Kate, I think, could be a vocal point. Jalen Duran, yeah, I mean, he he does kill it when he pr- practices with Team USA. He definitely has a handful of highlights when he does that. It, it's a lot of fun to watch because – you can just see, like, he wants to rip the rim down. He wants to out-rebound. Like, he he takes pride in playing with those other big names at his position. That's what I – I mean, and th- those three. I mean, I, I don't see Jaden Ivey. I did mention Isaiah Stewart, but I really th- – th- there's not really a chance for him. But those would be my three names right there that I think could eventually wear the red, white, and blue for the men's these, national team. These young guys got to – they have to progress. And even mm-hmm. Cade. Cade has to play better, I think. Um, to have that opportunity. But like I said, we got a lot of time before roster is even thought about being put together. And there's going to be a lot of young guys in the league that I think are going to want to start doing what LeBron has done and Steph Curry has done and kind of run with their type of tradition of being like, if I'm the best in the NBA, I want to be the best to go play for Team USA as well. Do you think players really take... Do you think they really do take pride in that? Or do you think when they're watching some of their favorite players like LeBron, like Carmelo Anthony in years past, Kobe Bryant, guys they grew up watching, do you think Team USA, it really does matter to these guys? Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I think they, they definitely take pride in their NBA careers a little. There's definitely pride in that. But, I mean, do you really think that they take a lot of pride playing for the Team USA team? Yeah, I, I think that's a huge honor. And a, it's a big accomplishment. I mean, I, I know that we've won multiple, multiple, multiple golds in men's basketball and women's basketball. Um, but I think it's it's an honor to. Re- I mean, I would love to do that. Oh yeah, I don't I, think that's I something that, that. I, I don't think that's an invite that they send to a Star Thompson and he tells them no. Um, so. I think he'd be, I think he probably think it's like spam mail opens it up and you got Rick rolled. Like, just kidding, dude, you're not actually going. Uh, this is a, a letter from Lance Caparossi. Uh, but I think, I think it's a big, it's a big traditional thing. Like, I think it's a huge opportunity. And plus, I mean, granted these guys make millions of dollars. So even saying this might sound stupid, but you get to go see the world too, dude. Like you get to go do a lot of cool things and represent your country. So I think it's something that, it's not something that gets turned down that often. I just feel like pride becomes a thing for these guys when they do bad in like the FIBA or like the world championship or something like that. Like they, I, you know, the joke is on social media, you know, Brandon Ingram led our C team for team USA. You know, you'll see things like that where, and then the LeBron James show up captain America and then Steph Curry. And then, Kevin Durant, they're all joining forces, but we're going to bring gold home. And it's like, I don't know, because I feel like it's also somewhat overlooked by basketball fans. Like these, I mean, dude, it's, it's a gold medal. It's a huge deal, but I still feel like in terms of accomplishments, when you're looking at a player's resume, it just, it doesn't hold that much weight. So I just really wonder how much a player cares about doing it you know what i'm saying i wonder how much convincing it really take needs to take place i mean if you look at other countries like the guys that went and played for their countries where they were from i mean they had a lot of pride like that takes yeah, a lot for nicole Jokic to go play with these guys from serbia like that takes a lot that means he really cares and i think that should be kind of reflected towards the guys from the u.s to go and actually want to compete and win a gold medal for your country. Like it's important. So hopefully after this year, um, people saw like, cause it was actually pretty competitive. Uh, a lot of the games were really close. It was actually, it was a lot of fun to watch. So maybe after this year, they started something where people take it more serious and they want to be a part of it. 
Yeah, I don't know if Team USA still does like, hey, you got to make a commitment to the program. We're meeting every summer. We're practicing. We're gelling with guys. You know, maybe we don't send, you know, the A squad over every year, but you guys are going to be a part of this. We'll send. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they still do that. I'm not sure. I don't really follow Team USA quite like I used to a few years ago when, like, the Redeem team, like the OA game, when they when, when they beat Spain. I still have that game downloaded and I watch it from time to time because I don't know. I just loved how everybody gelled on that team and the roles they were playing. It it was a lot of fun to watch. And I just feel like we're not, we don't really get that anymore with these guys. I mean, it was still fun, but Oh wait, that was something really special. Yeah. And, but I think they just need to take it more of a, like it's a legitimate opportunity for them. Like maybe, maybe we downplay that in people's career. When you look up their wiki page, if they're a hall of famer, we look up, they don't have like, they only have one gold medal or they have no gold medals. Or if they have four gold medals, like maybe we don't see that as important. And maybe we as fans should like take a, like some type of notification towards that, that it actually means something important. What do you think matters more to the average basketball fan all-star appearances or gold medals i would say gold medals to the average basketball fan okay fine i guess all-star appearances because that's something that they know well they notice every year yeah it's awarded every every single year not every four so i guess that's more obvious to see that they've had seven all-star appearances but to see that someone has three or four gold medals i think that's way more impressive or like being the all-time leading scorer for Team USA or, you know, I mean, Carmelo Anthony is one of the most decorated athletes when it comes to Olympic history in, in his sport, in basketball. He has quite a few medals from there. And, yeah, anyways, we can just move on. I, I'm thinking of way too many things right now, and I yeah. didn't mean for it to go this long <laughs> to open the podcast. But So what we're going to do on this episode, we're going to be doing our best breakdown on how we think the minutes will be distributed between a 10-man rotation so we're giving 48 minutes per position that's point guard that's shooting guard small forward power forward center all five positions and we know that basketball is positionless so really positions are broken down in terms of you know, there's a point, a guy that primarily plays the point guard. There's a combo guard who splits minutes between point guard and shooting guard. The wing position primarily plays his minutes at the two and the three. Forward primarily plays his, his minutes at the three and the four. And then the big, those guys that usually play center and some power forward. So we're going to be breaking it down by position, but we're also keeping that in mind. So when you hear some of these minute projections, don't go crazy on us you know just please listen to the whole thing and i promise you we're going to do our best to make it make sense so the first position is the point guard position so i have Cade cunningham out of the 48 minutes at the point guard spot i have him averaging 35 i think he will average close to 35 34 minutes per game in most of those minutes not saying every second will come at the point guard position but of those 35, he will be primarily playing the one spot to get those minutes. And then Jaden Ivey, I only went with two guards. He's my backup point guard, and I have him getting 13 minutes at the point guard position and filling out those 48. But how do you have the point guard position broken down? I mean, we yeah, like you said, like all these guys are interchangeable, whether they're running the one, two, or three. Like Cade can want, run one, two, and three, so we could – variate like his minutes towards those positions but that's such a headache to even deal with because on the floor you don't really know what maybe position he's running but you know that he's on the floor so you said 35 minutes for Cade I'm at like 33 to 35 minutes and it's all primarily going to be at the one spot when he's on the when he's on the floor no matter who he's with he's probably there's an 80 90 percent chance that he's going to be bringing the ball up so he will be running the one any time that he's on the floor because him playing off guard is unless we can get something out of Ivy for him to kind of play off ball, he's going to be primarily the distributor for us this year. And then to distribute the last of the minutes, I got Ivy um, running like 10 to 12 minutes at the point guard position. Um, and then maybe if foul, foul trouble becomes a problem, I, I gave Marcus Sasser four to five minutes at the one as well. So I left, Guys like Marcus Sasser, Ron Holland, 
Bobby Clitman, and I'm debating on whether I'm going to keep Paul Reed in this as well. So maybe my rotation's only between nine guys. I still think those guys will get minutes for the Detroit Pistons. I just think it will be really inconsistent. These guys that I'm talking about, the Cade Cunninghams, the Asars, the Tobias, the Simones, these are guys that are going to be getting consistent minutes throughout the season. These guys aren't going to – I don't expect them to be benched anytime during this year just because someone shows out. I don't think that's going to happen. And I think it's going to be – with the guys they have on the team, it's going to be hard for guys like Ron Holland and Bobby Clement to touch the floor early for the Detroit Pistons. Not saying it can't happen, but based on what who we have on the team right now, I think it will be a little bit tougher for them. So – I do want to say something to Jaden Ivey. I have him at 28 minutes per game. He averaged 28.8 last year in an inconsistent role under Monty Williams, but I still think he gets 28 minutes per game. And now we're going to talk about the two guard position, the shooting guard. So Malik Beasley, I have him getting the bulk of the minutes at the two spot at 25 per game. Then I have Jaden Ivey getting 15, 28 between that one and two position. He played 88% of his minutes at the two last year for the Detroit Pistons, and I think it was like 4%, and then some minutes at the three. But primarily, he got his minutes at the two, then the one. He's that combo guard I was talking about where when he's on the floor, he's getting minutes in the backcourt spot. And then I have eight minutes going to Tim Hardaway Jr. at the two spot. That's my minutes breakdown for the Detroit Pistons. But how does your shooting guard minutes project? I mean, I would agree with Malik Beasley getting most of the minutes at the two just because Jaden's going to run the one. So, like we said, the minutes are going to variate from one, two, and three, or four and five as well. So, for minutes, I think I have Malik getting the bulk at shooting guard with 20 minutes a game. I don't think he plays any small forward, any point guard. I just don't think that's how he's going to help this team out the best way possible. Um, I got Tim Hardaway Jr. around 15 minutes a game because he's also going to be – I know that we talked about off pod that he played a little bit of small forward as well. But yeah. I see him I see him primarily just at the two with us just because of all the options we have for the three position. So I, I see Malik with 20, uh, Tim Hardaway with 15, and then Jaden Ivey just rounding out just the basically scrap up minutes that he can fill – at the two guard while Cade's at the one as well. Yeah, and for people listening or watching, I should say, Tim Hardaway Jr. played 69% of his minutes at the small forward position, 72 the year before for the Dallas Mavericks. But again, that's a team with Luka and Kyrie Irving in that backcourt. And Tim Hardaway Jr., one of those guys you have to find minutes for, can still produce at an NBA level. In Malik Beasley, his minutes breakdown, he got 87% of his minutes at the two-guard spot last year for the Milwaukee Bucks, and 9% of his minutes came at the point guard. I'm actually surprised looking at his minutes breakdown on basketball reference. With the Lakers, he played 23% of his minutes at the one spot. But again, it's not like a true point guard position he was playing for the Los Angeles Lakers because you have LeBron James on the team. He just kind of playing that role. Again, positionless basketball. Yes. Let's talk about the small forward spot real quick. So at the three, I have Simone Fontecchio. I have him averaging 28 minutes per game. He averaged 30 with the Pistons last year. And then for the Utah Jazz, Simone Fontecchio, he's getting around 23, 24 minutes per game. That's why I kind of split the difference at 28. And I think – most of those, if not all of his minutes, will come at the three spot. Then I have Asar Thompson. I have him averaging 28 minutes per game and 12 of those minutes coming at the three spot. Then Tim Hardaway Jr., this is tough for me because I do think he will get more minutes for the Detroit Pistons, but I only have him getting eight minutes at the three spot. And again, he's a wing player. He's going to get most of his minutes at the two or the three. But I definitely think he averages more than 16 minutes per game. I'm still just trying to figure that out where who else I can take minutes, who I can take minutes away from, and how do I give them to Tim Hardaway Jr. But that's my small forward breakdown. How is yours looking for the minutes? So I know that you discussed with me that doing this, you were trying not to just because of rookies involved Bobby Clintman and Ron Holland. 
Um, and when I put this together, um, I wanted to involve them because I do think they're going to get minutes here at some point. But at the three spot, um, I have Fontecchio taking majority at the three position with around like 22 to 24 minutes. Asar Thompson, I got him coming in with 16 to 18 minutes. And then um, giving Ron Holland three to five. And then Tobias filling out for maybe foul trouble or just some type of if we're like drawing up a scheme or something, if we want to defend different, I have Tobias say he can also play the three position. I think Fontecchio and Tobias can be pretty interchangeable at three and four. So I their agree. minutes collab really weird. So that's kind of what I have. I, I want Ron Holland to get some minutes. I, I, I think he will get some there. Um, Cause we talked about garbage time, whether we're getting our ass kicked or we're somehow beating somebody by a lot of points, which don't get your hopes up for that this year. Um, but it's really hard kind of to dictate how you want to position these guys. Like overall I have Fontecchio getting 28 minutes and I have Tobias over 30 um, within the three and the four position, but this is a good problem to be discussing. Like I'd, mm-hmm. I'd rather be talking like this than saying, well, shit, Tobias has to play 39 minutes at the four because we don't have anybody. So that's mine rounding out the small forward spot. I, I like Asar either running the three or the four, it doesn't, doesn't mind. Like I I don't mind him being in either slot, but I think he's going to get a bulk of the minutes at the three, I think. But I mean, we're going to find out and see what coach wants to do. Yeah. It, it, it became tough for me at the, the three and the four spots, because again, a lot of these dudes are interchangeable. Like, and I mean, there's also a world where I see a Sar Thompson averaging like dude, 34, 35 minutes per game. He just plays with so much energy and so much effort. Like, it's hard to keep him off the floor. And last year, he only averaged 25 minutes per game. But he went through, again, In for some reason, he was in Monty Williams' doghouse for after he had a good start to his rookie year. I think it was like the next 18 or 20-something games. I haven't looked at it in a while where he, I think, played under – 20 minutes maybe even under 18 minutes per game so it was really weird like it's hard to predict how many minutes Asar could get and I just don't know who you move to the bench when I'm breaking this all down but this was a fun exercise but for the four spot the power forward I have Tobias Harris getting 34 minutes and that's how much I think you'll average for the game but I do agree with you him and Simone Fontecchio they're definitely interchangeable so I don't know at what moment, who is playing what position for the Detroit Pistons. I don't know the ins and outs of the team and how they draw up plays, but I think Tobias will get 34 minutes in most of those, if not all minutes, will come at the four spot. Then I have Asar Thompson getting 14 minutes at the four spot. And again, this is something where, dude, I mean, if him and Tobias Harris are on the floor together, which I think they will be, do you move Tobias to the three? And then you have Asar Thompson playing the four, setting screens for Cade and running some pick and roll action. Is that what we get with Asar Thompson and Tobias Harris on the floor? I'm not sure, but that's how I have my minutes break broke down between those two at the four spot. But again, Simone Fontecchio could get some minutes. Isaiah Stewart could get some minutes at the power forward. But yeah. for the sake of this exercise, I just got him going to Tobias and Asar Thompson. Yeah, and I have Tobias leading with around 28 to 30 minutes, followed by Asar Thompson with 10, like 8 to 10, 10 to 12. It all can vary. Um, Fontecchio getting just a little bit of minutes there with 4 to 5, and then even Stewart doing 4 to 5 minutes as well at the 4 position. But I think when it comes to the 3 and the 4, I don't think it's a position we have to worry about having somebody in there that's going to be some type of vulnerability to the to the defense. Because I think all the guys that we have to plug in place for these lineups, I think they're all good enough players to be able to compete at a high level. Mm. I agree with that as well. I really do. So at the center position, I could have made this more interesting for myself, but I didn't. So I have Jalen <laughs> Duran getting 30 minutes per game. The, it's, it's tough to pick for him because I think he can be effective at 28. But I also could see him averaging 32. So last year, he averaged 29 minutes per game. His rookie year, he averaged 24.9. And when you look at his position breakdown, 
hundred percent of his minutes came at the five spot. I don't think there's any world where we see him getting minutes at any other position when yeah. he's on the floor. All of his minutes will come at the five. And again, this is a dude that he does play with a ton of effort. He's really well conditioned. He really takes care of his body. This is a guy that like 30 minutes to me, when I'm saying it out loud, it seems kind of low, you know, like I would love to see him getting close to 34 playing on defense, keeping himself out of foul trouble. It's a lot to wish for, but that's what I would like to see, but he's getting 30 minutes per game for me at the five. And then Isaiah Stewart's getting 18 minutes at the back of five position. Like I love him in that role. I think Isaiah Stewart could average close to like 22. And I think he's one of those players that does take a huge hit in the minutes department because now we have, you know, three, maybe even four guys that could get minutes at the four spot. And that's Tobias, Asar, Simone, Bobby Clintman. Depends on how, you know, they play in training camp. Maybe Bobby Clintman does surprise everybody. But I just don't think there's enough minutes for Isaiah Stewart to get them at that power forward spot. So that's why I'm saying 18 minutes at the center position. But just like how I said Jalen Dern at 30 seemed kind of low, Isaiah Stewart at 18, that also seems kind of low. But how do you break down the five spot? Uh, with Stewart can go lower, everything's going to be okay. Like, yeah, I know, wrong yeah, I know you want to see him play. Um, so with my five spot, it's obvious. Like I only have two guys that are locked into the same position, and that's Cade Cunningham at the one and Jalen Duran at the five. So I think we keep Duran between 30 and 33 minutes. I don't think we go anything higher than that. Um, and then Beef Stew comes in with 10 to 12. And then I have Bobby Clintman getting minutes at the five spot. And the reason that I say this is just like we said, uh, a lot of these positions are interchangeable. And I see a world where Bobby Clintman and Beef Stew are on the court at the same time. I do see a world of that happening just because of the way that they both spread the floor the way that they do. So I have Clintman getting minutes at the five just because you can move him and Beef Stew around. I don't think Jalen Duran. I think he stays at the five position. I just don't think where his skill set is that he is in a good enough spot where we can put him at the four. That would be a huge liability with him playing the four position for us. But I think with Clintman and I think with Stewart, I think both of them bring a good enough like attribute to the team that they can be on the floor with some of these guys and make it successful. Because I like I like I like Clintman out there with Beef Stew because I think Stewart is more prone to being a defensive minded guy. So that gives so Stu can defend the five while Clintman can defend the four. Yeah, no, I mean I I like where your head is at when it comes to Bobby Clintman. And I I definitely want to see him on the floor. I just think there's a few things that need to be cleaned up. Needs to get his body ready for an NBA season. It's 82 games, it's grueling, it's a gauntlet. You know, I mean that's what makes NBA athletes so great. I mean, to be able to play 82 games in the time frame that they do, then, you know, you play in the NBA, then maybe you're doing stuff like, you know, Team USA in the summer. You're playing well over 100 games pretty much per year if you're committed to all this stuff. But I just don't know. I mean, Bobby Clinton at the four and Isaiah Stewart at the five. Dude, I hope we see it at some point. I really do. I hope Bobby Clinton shows out during practice where J.B. Bickerstaff says, yes, we have to get this guy on the floor. I just don't know if we will just right away. That's the only thing. But, I mean, if you're putting Bobby Clement on the floor, just say at the four, who who are you taking minutes away from at that spot? I mean, if I'm going to – I mean, he'd just be more of a rotation piece. Okay. But if, if I see him taking away minutes from anybody that's in the four position, it's going to be Asar Thompson. Okay. Because cause you could put – because say Asar is not shooting well, knock on wood – that we see what we saw last year. Maybe he's not shooting the ball well, then Clintman can come and provide that if he is shooting the ball well. I mean, all of this is hypothetical. Yeah. But if I'm taking away minutes, I'm it's going to be more taken away from Asar Thompson than it is going to be Tobias. Tobias is a pro. We know what Tobias is going to bring to the table. That's why it's so nice to have him locked in that four position because we know what we're going to get out of him with his minutes. So – but yeah, if he's going to steal minutes, it's going to be from Asar Thompson. But even so, you can still have Asar run the three. You could have Asar be in the two spot if you had to. Like he can go anywhere you need him. So I wouldn't essentially call it stealing minutes. I would just call it like just replacing them like game by game. It's not going to be every single game. 
Yeah, I don't know if I, I I think he would be more likely to take minutes away from Tobias Harris because he is he's up there. I think Tobias would be fine with saying playing 28 minutes per game. If he's like, hey, you know, I gotta take a I gotta get less minutes at the four spot in order to open up minutes for Bobby Clinton, we'll just say that. I think Tobias would do it. I, I just don't see the world where I mean, unless unless the star takes like a major leap backwards where he's shooting like less than 10% from three. Like, you know what I'm saying? Where he even looks worse than he did last year. Yeah. I just don't see the world where you because he's so good defensively. Like he he really provides something that this team has been missing for so long. And he plays with such great energy and such a high motor that it really is hard to keep him off the floor. Even though he can't shoot the ball super well, he does make a difference with his play that I just don't know if I see a second round draft pick taking minutes from him. But if you were to tell me like, hey, word, you know, I Tobias Harris isn't going to get 34 minutes game. He's going to get 28. And then Bobby Clemens going to have an opportunity to earn more minutes. I could see it in that. I could see that happening more than Bobby Clemens stealing minutes or taking minutes away from Asar Thompson. I just hope that we're looking, we're not looking at minutes directly. We're, we're looking at minutes of how well they're playing. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like I don't want to just hold someone to 28 minutes because that's what you're capped at. Like if they're playing well, I want to see it exceeded. And I think that's something that we had to go through with Monty. I think Monty was strictly capped. Jaden Ivey can only play 26 minutes. It doesn't matter how well he's shooting the ball. He's going to come out and we're going to put someone else in. I, I want minutes not to be a restriction. I want minutes to go by how the feel is, how well they're playing and let it like, let it actually be cohesive with the team. So Hopefully that's the kind of basketball we're going to see. But like we said, a lot of this is just super interchangeable. It's really hard to kind of dedicate certain minutes to certain people just because how young this team is and how like how well they are going to perform because we have no idea what we're in store for. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a fun exercise to think about throughout the week. And I'm looking at the bigs for Cleveland last year. So Jared Allen played 31.7 minutes per game in 77 games. For Cleveland, the year before, he averaged 32.6. The year before that, 32.3. And then Evan Mobley last year played 30.6 in 50 games. He played 34.4 and 33.8 before that. So not like a ton of, not huge minutes given to these guys at these positions. Donovan Mitchell averaged 35 under J.B. Bickerstaff. Last year, Darius Garland was at 33. I think that kind of gives us insight of how he'll play his starters yep. and how many minutes they'll get. But I also, I agree with you. Like, I don't, I'm not looking at this like Tobias Harris has to play 34 minutes. Cade Cunningham has to play 35. Um, Simone Fontecchio has to play 28. Like, we have to get into these numbers. I think that's just a projection, and I think it's a, it's, it's a fine median where you're going to see some games where Simone Fontecchio plays like 38 minutes per game. Yeah. So, we're probably going to see that because one, there's going to be foul trouble. There's going to be injuries. He might just be feeling it one night where you want to keep riding that hot hand. Yeah. There's going to be games where Cade Cunningham plays under 30 minutes again, because of foul trouble. Maybe he's struggling offensively. Maybe Jaden Ivy's going off. Maybe Marcus Sasser's doing something. Yeah. But I think what we've done and I'm patting ourselves on the back is I think we've done a pretty good job of project pro projecting these minutes and, you know, just, you know, having fun with a little bit of an exercise that we were doing on this. Yeah, you don't, we don't know. We're not going to really even know, I think, within the first 10 games of what we're going to be expecting with minutes, because I still think they're going to be working out a lot of kinks in the roster and how they want to play and how they want to attack other teams. So it's, we're not really going to know a lot, I think, until we're like 20 games into the season to see how much they want to vary these guys being on the court with other with other players, because I think that's what it boils down to, too, is how well these guys are actually competing with each other. Okay, so final question before we end the podcast. Do you see J.B. Baker's staff going with an eight- to nine-man rotation, or do you see him going with a ten-man rotation with everybody being healthy on this team? I All I know is he's not going to lie to us like Monty did. I think that's what I can expect, is if someone's going to ask that question of how many people we're going to be putting 
into games, I think we're actually going to get the right answer from him and we're going to expect that from him. But with how good of the roster, like with, I I don't want to say how good it is, but with what we have, like with opportunity at hand with a lot of these guys, I hope he does open it up to a nine and 10 man roster to the, at the beginning of the season until we can figure out how we're playing together, how these guys are meshing together. And then you drop it down to eight, like, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think we have, we're going to be like 10 to like 15 to 20 games deep before we kind of figure out what JB wants to do with the guys on the roster. Okay. Okay. I think we'll see a tight eight to nine man rotation when everybody's healthy. I think there's somebody that we have listed tonight on this episode that will be, that we're going to be surprised they're not getting a lot of minutes with him. That's what I'll say, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you guys for listening to the Three Championship Drive podcast. Do us a favor, go to Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and hit the follow button. After you hit the follow button, rate with five stars, and tell us who you think will be getting the most minutes per game for the Detroit Pistons. But more importantly, tell a Pistons fan.